A giant tsunami had hit Kar Nicobar in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands off the Indian coast. This had been triggered by a massive earthquake that ripped apart the west of Sumatra in Indonesia approximately 30 minutes earlier. Leave me, Ajay tried to say aloud, more saline water getting into his mouth. I have to save Bulbul, my daughter. She is just there somewhere. But the man continued to pull Ajay back. Let go of me, I just shouted again, but the other man knew better. The ocean water had made devastating inroads more than 1.2 kilometers from the coast. The entire airbase was flooded. The water level had risen more than 20 feet. Soon, Ajay was taken to a dry area. Everything around had been destroyed, as if Mahakala had run through the area like it was an apocalypse. The tidal waves of the tsunami had torn up homes like they were made out of paper, ripped apart jetties, smashed fishing boats, reduced co coconut trees to twigs. An emergency area was set up as a temporary meeting point. Ajay put his head between his hands and wailed inconsolably, like only a parent would. Bulbul doesn't know how to swim, he howled. She doesn't know how to swim. She doesn't even like water. Everyone had their own tragedies to deal with, and yet some people around tried to console the grieving father. A bit of kindness is worth more than any precious gift when you're lost and lonely. Where's my wife, my son? He asked and looked around as if he had just woken up from a bad dream. Bulbul, Rama, Neeraj, where are they? Where's my wife, my son? He was sobbing and repeating the words when, at a distance, he saw his neighbor on a motorcycle. His wife was sitting behind him and still holding tightly to their son. Thank God, my wife and my son are alive. I'll find my daughter. Bulbul is brave. The water will recede very quickly, he's thinking. He ran towards the motorcycle like a madman. Rama, Rama, Ajay screamed at the top of his lungs. Thank God you're safe. Thank God Neeraj is safe, he said, stopping the motorcycle. And then he snatched Neeraj out of Rama's hands to hold him tightly, to smother him, the apple of his eyes, with kisses. Ajay kissed his son as if he had just returned from a long war and was seeing him after years. This entire episode from reading about the Indian cricket team to the present moment, had taken less than 60 minutes. And those 60 minutes felt like 60 years. Neeraj's body was cold from the splashes of the tsunami water. Ajay himself was soaked, as was his wife and friend. And there was no warm blanket nearby. My son must be feeling cold, he thought. And he cast a glance here and there to see if there was any dry or warm clothing nearby. But Neeraj seemed unaffected, even at peace. You okay, my baby, my son? Ajay asked, stroking Neeraj's soft hair and gently stroking his cold scalp. Of course, Neeraj didn't respond. The boy was only one year old and hadn't yet started talking. He never would. His body wasn't cold from the lack of heat, but life. Neeraj was dead. It took Ajay a minute to realize that. He frantically tried to revive him by performing CPR on him. They rushed him to the doctor in the camp who declared him dead. Between anxiety and disbelief, Hope and loss, between sorrow and despair, celebrations and mourning, Ajay and Rama lived an entire lifetime in a few hours. Like scavengers searching for food, they scoured the island looking for their daughter. Rama was too shocked to do much more. Her son had died in her own arms. But Ajay wasn't ready to give up. He could have saved his daughter how could he have let her hand slip out of his? He was a marine par excellence, fit and strong. He had climbed down ocean into ocean waters from plains. He could run up an almost vertical wall, and here he was, incapable of holding onto a tender little hand. 
No, it couldn't be right. The next day, due to a mandatory evacuation order, they were airlifted from Karnikobar and shifted to a base in Chennai. Without their son and without their daughter. But they were not alone. Immense grief, pain and unbearable sadness huddled around them, keeping them company. Aj's story doesn't end here. Years later, he met me and narrated this horror in person. He had come to me with hope, great hope, with a feeling that I might be able to help him trace his daughter. I'll tell you what happened, but more than the story, it's the message I want to share. When you look around, what do you see? Happy faces, smiling couples, tense looks, or anxious people? Maybe all of these. Since childhood, we are told to be strong, to put on a brave face, to not cry or complain. We must not come across as weak to the rest of the world because the weak get exploited, they get crushed. It's survival of the fittest, they say. In trying to be strong, however, sometimes we become so strong that we become indifferent. Indifferent and insensitive to our own pain and to the pain of others around us. And to feel that bliss again, the kind we did as small children without a care in the world, not including our parents' scoldings or beatings, of course. We try all sorts of things, from marijuana to meditation, from detachment through yoga to indulgence in youth, from blue pills to sleeping pills and everything in between. True or lasting happiness, however, still remains elusive. Do you ever wonder why? I've met thousands of people who have followed their religions, lived by the book, tried meditating, and yet sadness seems like a disgruntled ex who won't stop stalking you. Is there an answer to this? Maybe not. But I do have some learnings. Forget all that you know for a moment. Put aside your religious and moral precepts and let's not get into what is right or wrong for the time being. Let's walk away from the concepts we grew up reading in scriptures or yogic books. Let me share with you the science of happiness. Don't get me wrong. There's always room for meditation, faith and your views about life. In fact, we will be using all these, but for now, I must continue with the most important element. Yes, most important than meditation or any yogic practice you might have ever come across. In Narada Samhita, the sage Narada asks Krishna where the Supreme Soul lives <clears throat> as he wonders how to find that supreme bliss. Krishna replies, Naham Vasami Vaikunthe Yogi Nam Hride Nacha Mad Bhakta Yatra Gayanti Tatra Narada O oh, Narada, I don't live in Vaikuntha or in the minds of yogis. I live wherever my glories are sung lovingly. But what does it mean to sing his glories? Is it singing gospel, Sufi Kawali, doing kirtan or reading scriptures out loud? Are religious people happier than non-believers? No, not necessarily. So what is the mystical path to happiness, if any? The good news is, it is possible to experience a near constant flow of bliss in your life. Your situation may still be painful. People may still hurt you. Success may still elude you. Or life may still be difficult. But you will remain steadfast in your highest state of consciousness. And this can be achieved for the most part of your day. Nearly 23 out of the 24 hours. As I said, please put away all that you know you've learned so far. In this book, I'm not asking you to meditate. I'm not telling you how mantras can transform your life or how you can experience samadhi. People who live through such things are only marginally better off than those who don't. Instead, instead, I'd like to share with you something even more powerful and practical. It works. Let me take you back to Ajay's story. His could have been anyone's story. Yours, mine, or someone else's. 
If my message finds its way into your heart, the rest will come to you naturally, because accomplishing any feat becomes a whole lot easier once you have your heart set on it. And it's your heart we need to look into. Your mind is fine. It can focus, think, process, analyze, internalize. But it is your heart that interests me. That's where everything builds up. The brain only processes what the heart is feeling. And our heart can feel a million things in just one day. We just need to connect with it so it feels the one thing that matters most. Second chapter. 